So hi, everybody. Uh, once again, my name is Robert. I'm an engineering manager at Algolia. Um, I work on the mobile team. So basically, we're building all the blocks for um, the interaction with Algolia. Uh, what does it actually mean is in practice? It means we provide different frameworks. One would be the client. So you can actually make connections to Algolia, retrieve your data, and that's kind of it. And then um, we have this framework called Instant Search, which allows you to build UI and UX in a faster way. So instead of rewriting everything from scratch, you know, the search bar, the table view, the filters, and so on, uh, we provide that for you, and you can just you know, drag and drop it in your apps. Um, and Algolia, historically, we started with the search box. We start working on the search box, and we kind of build a way up from there. Uh, but we've been seeing in the last you know, years that a lot of hype words and things that are trending are going on around AI, around voice search, around NLP, around all those things. Um, we start looking what actually can be interesting for us um, to you know, test it in production and see how we can actually help our customers. Um, so tonight, I'm going to show you how we actually approach voice search and conversational search in a small demo so that everybody can actually build it without needing any you know, big research team or whatsoever. Um, before jumping into everything technical, I have a question. Who actually built anything around voice or conversational in their uh, mobile apps? Perfect. Um, okay. <clears throat> so why am I showing a Nokia? Oh, sorry. Uh, I should not move that much. Um, so we're actually building a framework for Nokia 3310. No? Uh, bad joke, I tried it. Um, so historically, when you think about how we actually use, um, how we do search, how we type, how we communicate uh, when it comes to phones, um, it's been using a keyboard. So in the beginning, we, we kind of had this keyboard where I know who remembers this. You had to type one, two, three, four times to actually get to the character and so on. So it's taking a lot of time. Um, it's definitely not something natural. We got used to it just for a simple reason. We had technical limitations back in the day. Then we kind of moved to a more normal approach. Like, this is a normal keyboard. We know how to handle it. Uh, we got used to it, but still, like, it's not natural. It's I still need to type whenever I want to communicate something. Um, recently, well, not that recently, Apple introduced and Android introduced um, the, the voice. So now you can actually use voice. This one actually brings us closer to our nat like natural order. We tend to communicate. We use our mouth, we, we say words, and that's how we communicate. We don't need to spend that much time on typing. Um, and this is an interesting thing. Like, OK, maybe messaging is not the best use case, because I'm not going to say in the subway my message is around all the people. But when you think about search, when you think about actually navigating, it can be a really good uh, thing. So we start looking at the stats, and we saw like 20% of all the Google searches today are made by voice. That's pretty impressive. I don't know who actually uses voice to search on Google here. OK, not 20%. <laughs> uh, and the estimations are that by 2020, 50% of all the searches are going to be made by voice. And this is. Don't trust me, we just got this picture from a conference. Uh, someone was saying like 40% of the millennials were already making search through a voice assistant uh, prior to actually buying. Made Mike sense or not, you know, uh, don't take my word for it. Before jumping into technical questions and technical uh, things, let's say what voice versus conversational actually is, at least for us. So when I talk about voice, it's basically replacing typing with voice. So I go on Amazon, I say blue shoes, um, and you know, I get results. Conversational is more like getting close to, to actual human interaction. Like if I go into a store, I'm not gonna see the, the vendor and say blue shoes and that's it. No, I'm gonna say, hey, how's it going? Do you have some blue shoes from Gucci? Cool, do you have my size? So it's still a communication. And this conversational brings us closer to that. So I'm just gonna show you a small demo of uh, what we built. Uh, so the front end, the iOS application was built in under one day, 
around a half a day. Um, everything else, the backend uh, implementation was already made by one of my coworkers, Paul Lee, which is not here. Um, but it's still impressive how fast you can you go and build something in under a day, um, which was almost impossible five years ago. Hey. Hello. What can you do? You can say things like, do you know Eminem to ask me about my music knowledge? Cool. I actually need some help. I was born to help you. Perfect. Do you have any songs about love? I know several songs on love. Love rain over me. California love. Whole lot of love. How about Led Zeppelin? I know several songs by Led Zeppelin, Kashmir, Stairway to Heaven, Whole Lot of Love. And Rolling Stones? Here's several songs by the Rolling Stones. I can't get no satisfaction. Honky Tonk Women, you can't always get what you want. Perfect. Play the first one. Okay, so that's that. Um, nope. Cool. So now we're gonna talk. Is this gonna work? Yes. Uh, on how does it work, actually. So there are three main components here. Uh, one is the mobile interface. Um, I changed something and it didn't change. But OK, so it's the mobile interface, not search, because you know there's no actual search there. Uh, then we have a conversational agent, which basically allows us to uh, understand what's going on and what I'm saying. And then a backend to, uh, by powered by Algolia to do the search on the entities. Um, and we'll get into technical details immediately. But before that, um, why? how was this more challenging than actual search, like when you use a search bar? Um, there are a couple of reasons. So first is you need to be fast. You need to kind of have a conversation. Uh, second, you need to be relevant. The first results are most important. Uh, query can be messy because, you know, you talk a lot sometimes. Uh, and then you need to go, the search must go beyond just typos. So why speed is fast? Because when you're having a conversation, if you start saying things and then you wait for a minute to get a reply, well, that's not actually a proper conversation. So you're going to get bored and say, OK, I'm going to use my keyboard. Um, by using Algolia, we actually aim to go under 50 milliseconds when we're doing search. Then you can think about uh, how long does it actually take to process audio into text, then the text into intent, and uh, extract entities, and so on. Second is relevance. So relevance is very important. You, you saw it in my video. I left some typos there. Um, I said, how can you help me? And she understood how can I help me or things like this. So um, audio, like speech to text, is not perfect. So sometimes you're going to have things that are not going to be understood properly. Um, you need to have a system where it's going to be able to understand your actual intent and be able to give you the best answer to even your you know, typos. Second is synonyms. Um, so just because I have something in mind and I know how to say something like VUI, which means engine voice, no, sorry, voice user interface, doesn't mean everybody thinks the same. So sometimes we might use different words uh, than other people, and we, meet, uh, we need to be able to uh, understand all those things. Um, we at Algolia, we have this thing called query rules, which allows you to um, make your search like even relevant by specifying things that are interesting and like um, tagging them. So when I say find me a cheap computer from Dell or do you have any cheap Dell computer, uh, I'm saying two different um, phrases, but the meaning is the same. So with this, you kind of aim to uh, specify what you need. So we are able to extract things like what's the type you're looking for, what's the brand, and cheap, what does it actually mean for your business? In this case, for example, it can mean under $500. I've been talking a lot, uh, and we tend to do the same when you're doing voice search. So sometimes we say a lot of things. 
Um, and if we're trying to be too precise, you're not going to find results. So another thing that we can do is consider some words optional. So just because I don't have any red dress with flowers for a cocktail party, um, I can have a red dress with flowers. Might not fit for a cocktail party, but we don't know. We are able to actually remove some parts and still show you something. So now let's dive into what actually is interesting for you, the front end, um, which is the actual interface. Um, so we have three things that we're going to talk about, um, but the main part on the app is the speech to text, which basically allows you to send your voice to the agent. When I say agent, is basically the system behind uh, that understands the intent. Um, then you have the intent detection and data retrieval. So based on what you're saying uh, and based on what you're sending, you're going to get back um, first the reply, because you saw like the uh, thingy was talking back to me. Uh, and second, the actual data that you need to show. And then, because we wanted to make it talk, well, we use the text, text to speech to turn the response into a voice. So, for the front end, I don't know if you guys already, yeah, girls, work with this. Um, there are three main components. Uh, and you'll see it's simple enough. The first one is the audio engine, which basically helps you generate and process the audio signals. Second is the speech recognizer, which is going to generate the text from the speech, and the speech synthesizer, which is going to transform the text into an actual speech. So let me show you a bit how it looks. I'm not going to show you the entire app. I'm just going to show you um, the most important things. Um, so for the recording part, basically what's happening is you have the audio engine, which gives you access to an input node. This is a basic singleton, which allows you to uh, access what's going into a, to a node uh, and output you know, the, the actual uh, audio. Second thing that's important, you have a speech um, audio buffer recognition request. So this is going to allow you to, for everything that is said to get the data, the, the, the bits of uh, stream that are getting from audio, and um, append them to, to the request. Of course, you prepare the, the engine, can fail if you, know, you don't have an input node that is ready or things like that. Um, then with the speech recognizer, basically you're going to ask for a task, uh, which is getting backed with the request you're building. So with all this audio that I'm sending, please try to compute it into something that I can understand. Um, and then you're going to have some things back. Um, first, you're going to get a result and an error if the case. So the result is going to give you access to a lot of things based on what you're saying. But first, what we are actually um, using here is, one, the actual the best transcription of what you're saying. And this thing is actually changing at every um, input in the stream. So in the beginning, maybe it's not going to understand correctly what you're saying, but it's going to adapt. And then you can detect if what you said is final or not. So based on you know when you stop talking and so on, uh, it's going to say, OK, this is it. You can process it. So every time we actually get some uh, text back, we're going to you know, put it back to uh, the controller that is using it. Uh, so we can actually show in real life, I mean, not in real life, but in real time, uh, what you're saying. And if it's an error, you can you know, change it. Um, the recording, when you stop recording, you, know, you just destroy everything and you remove the tab. Um, and now, doo -doo -doo. OK. So on the UI part, the actual search view controller, um, once that you actually start you know, the, the recording, what we're doing is we use the controller I showed you before, which is the speech recognition uh, recognizer uh, with two handlers. One, every time I get the text, I first thing, I'm just going to save the, the new text. And then the debug voice label is what you're seeing up top with the actual test I'm saying. Um, and if it's final, I'm just going to stop the recording, and so I can process the actual search. Okay, and so this is it. This part, it's just about basically speech to text. Then once that we actually have a text that we want to process, what we're going to do is we're going to start uh, searching for it. Uh, this is where uh, another API is coming into, into the game, which is called Dialogflow, and I'm going to tell you more about it later. But this basically gives you like an SDK that you can install it with like pod and so on. Um, you initialize it with the, the keys and so, and then you have access to uh, the requests. 
So you're going to create a new request every time you have a text. Um, you're going to set the query for it, which what has been said. And then you, know, you send the request, and you get the completion whenever it's done. So this request basically uh, what's going to give you is two things. Uh, the response, like if you actually have a response with the actual message that is getting back, the data that was retrieved, um, and like how accurate they think they interpreted everything, uh, the entities, and so on. And the second, of course, if you have an error. Um, okay. When we actually created, uh, when we're using Dialogflow, um, that I'm going to show you later, we build it with two intentions in mind. One is we actually want results. So we want a list of different uh, songs. Or, yeah, songs. The second one is when I say play something, I don't know, play number four or play uh, Joe Coker. That's the second intent. And based on that, we're going to actually you know, do the action. Um, and last but not least, like I told you, Dialogflow is going to give you back the list of results and what you need to show and the speech that you need to, or at least the text that you need to display as for the bot. So that's where the synthesizer comes into place. With that text that the dialogue flow is getting back, we create a speech with that text. We select the language that we want to use it. Uh, we, we can you know, work with the pitch. We can work with the volume. We can work with like, different stuff around um, the actual voice. And then we just say speak. So with four lines of code, you can actually have that uh, proper synthesizer. OK. So that's that on the actual uh, front end. The intent detection, from now on, I'm going to go a bit faster. Um, so like I said, the conversational agent, um, it was built with Dialogflow. Dialogflow is previous API.ai for those who actually used it. Uh, we customize it in order to uh, recognize two entities. So the ones that are uh, interesting for us are search and play. And then the entities we're looking for are teams and artists. So teams can be a song, for example, or like I said, love. Uh, the whole goal of the conversational accent, yes, I'm going faster, uh, is to actually transform a sentence into an intent plus the parameters and to actually turn their search results back into a response. So whenever we get stuff from Algolia, we ship it back to, to the app. Um, there are two ways to actually customize the entities. One is system provided, so they could recognize things like colors, things like even some, like they recognize Rolling Stones, but they don't recognize the cooks. Uh, if you want to actually have your own entities, there are two ways to do it. One, you manually create the entities. And second, you, they have this automated expansion feature that would generalize. So every time you're saying, can you search for whatever? In the beginning, they're not going to understand that whatever is an entity. But if you're doing it long enough and you train the system, it's going to be able to understand it. And it's going to send it back to you as a proper entity of you know, song. Um, the only problem with Dialogflow that we encounter, like it looked magic in the beginning, we, ha we had a lot less control when it comes to entity recognitions. Um, so what I'm saying about entity recognition is things like you know, typo tolerance, polarization, when we have two precise queries, and advanced synonyms. So typos, things like, I want to look for doc, blah, 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 doc search, but I make a mistake. Um, it's not going to recognize it as an entity, but then it's going to train. It's going to uh, recognize it. Still, if I don't have anything in my database as the ex exact spelled word is not going to work. The way we fix it with Algolia, that's why we're using uh, our backend, is we have our ranking formula, and we have all these things around search. So we can um, have typo tolerance. Um, we can customize it, like how many actual um, characters I can miss based on the size of the string. And we can actually have allow numeric tokens. So let's say I'm looking for. Uh, the song um, 500 miles, but I forgot, and I'm sorry, like, look for 800 miles. Um, I can fix that too. Second is polarization. For whatever reason, um, let's say I have body parts, which are entities. Uh, they know heads and head is the same thing. They know feet and foot is the same thing, but hands and hand, no. So it's up and going. Um, we're, same thing, we're using the ignore pros from Algolia. So if I'm looking for um, the song Raining Men, um, which is actually Raining Men, well, now I can find it. Uh, two precise queries. So do you guys know the song uh, Touch Me From uh, The Doors? No. 
Um, I knew the song and I thought all his thought is touch me baby because it's in the actual lyrics. If you look for that, you're not gonna find it. Um, we have these things called uh, remove words if no results. You can be the last word, the first words, or all words are optional. Uh, and this way I can actually find the song. Yeah, I don't know Touch Me Baby, but I know the Doors uh, have a song called Touch Me. Synonyms. Um, I need to go faster. Uh, so synonyms, basically what's happening is, let's say I'm looking for uh, rock songs, but I don't have a lot of rock songs in my data set. Um, maybe punk, we can consider it as wrong, a rock. Um, and there are two use cases, big use cases. One, if I'm looking for new wave, um, sorry, for punk, but I don't have a lot of punk word uh, songs, maybe new wave or oi is a subcategory of it. So I can actually display songs from that subcategory because they're still considered as punk. Um, even though in my query, I have the punk word. The other one is I can have alternatives. So punk, we could consider it is rock. So every time I'm looking for punk, uh, I'm gonna see rock results on the bottom because they're not you know, a subcategory of punk, but they're still synonyms. Last but not least, the backend. Uh, this is the easy one. It's just a gateway to Algolia. Uh, basically, based um, dialog flow is going to call Algolia. Uh, this backend, sorry, with the actual entities we're looking for. The backend is just going to make a request to Algolia, um, get the result back, ship it to the dialog flow, and get it back within the app after. Um, just for the sake of saying it, it was built with Node.js and Happy, which is a framework for building APIs, and is hosted on Heroku. Thank you. So now if you have any questions. Is there any way to hint the default uh, Apple speech recognizer with like a vocabulary or something like this? I mean, what, what do you mean? So basically using the, key the, the one from the keyboard? No, no, uh, I mean the first step of speech uh, recognition. Yes. Uh, can you provide a vocabulary like to make it the recognition more accurate? Like uh, at one point there is a Rolling Stones yep. uh, appearance and it's changed from something that's not Rolling Stones to capitalize Rolling Stones. Yep. And I wondered uh, if the speech recognizer did this or is it if it is corrected by the next layers of your architecture or if the speech recognizer did this, is there a way to, I mean, to provide it some okay. things that it wouldn't know? So basically the question is, can you actually train the speech recognizer uh, to adapt to what you're saying or you need to correct it yeah, in to a different your domain. way? Um, so, so far I didn't find any ways to actually train them, okay. um, but that's why we're actually using different layers to like, that's why we're using Algolia to be able to correct it if something happens, uh, but to answer no. Okay, and so at that point uh, in your demo, when Rolling you say Rolling Stones, and yes. it comes up on screen uh, after uh, some amount of time as Rolling Stones, yeah. this is actually the speech recognizer output, or this is some lower oh, layer gotcha. of the architecture. Okay, so the way speech recognition works is every time you're saying things, that you get you know different streams of audio, so they are gonna try to understand what you're saying. So they, they try to make sense of your s sentences, uh, and every time you append a new word or a new you know sound they're gonna reload the entire logic and try to correct if the, those things were not uh, smart enough. So that's why you might see in the beginning um, something that is gonna change into a proper way because they are actually doing it uh, on the entire audio every time. Yeah, okay, and in the end, Apple knew about yes, Rolling Stones. exactly. They, they yeah, okay, so they do actually, they, okay. uh, one thing that I forgot to say, and I think it's important, especially with GDPR, is um, the way the speech recognition works, um, there are some locales that they're gonna be processed internally on the phone, uh, but most of them they're gonna be processed at Apple. So everything you say, it's gonna be sent to, um, to the Apple servers. So if you have apps that are using this, put that in your GDPR terms and conditions. This is not an advice, but it's just uh, you know, something that you should think about it. Okay. Is there any other questions? So most of work is done on Don't the hesitate side, to uh, speak a bit more closer. But what kind of work is done uh, actually on mobile side to unpatch uh, 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 typos changing? Uh, even typos changing is uh, done on backend side? Yes. So, uh, like, you need to choose at some point. Like, you could restart recoding a lot of things on mobile. Uh, 
but because everything is intense and you want to have a really competitive speed, uh, if you start processing a lot of text and a lot of audio on mobile, sometimes it might just be too long. Um, so yes, that's, that's what you're doing. You're gonna use the backends or, I mean, in this case, the speech recognizer, it's on their Apple's backend. It's not even on ours, so we don't truly control it. Right. But I mean, a lot of people have been doing like fuzzy, fuzzy search or um, typo tolerance or things like this on mobile and it works. Like Algolia, historically, that's how it was created. It was a sp uh, search engine on mobile. Um, so it's, it's doable, it's just think about your customers and like the, the, the constraints. Uh, I think. Uh, how many languages do you manage actually? Sorry? How, how many languages do you manage actually? Uh, no, that's a good question. How many languages? Um, so it's based on locales. And I think I ha they have around, I don't know, 30, 40 locales that they support. Uh, if you look in the documentation, um, the way we build it is you kind of look like there are methods to check if a locale is, is uh, available or not. So you can just run a four and that's it. Uh, but I don't know the exact amount of uh, locales. Okay, we are running a bit late. So, Robert. Last question or no? <laughs> Sorry, okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you can come and see me after and I'll answer all the questions. Thank you guys. Thank you, Robert. <laughs>